have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter number 2 this morning. Colossians chapter number 2. Welcome here to First Baptist Church. Many visitors here. We're glad you're here this morning. Our theme this year is rooted in him. It's rooted in Jesus Christ. It is not a rooted in a pastor or rooted in a staff or rooted in a philosophy. It's rooted in Jesus Christ. And my prayer, my desire, what God wants for every single person is to be founded, to be established, to be rooted in Jesus Christ. There are so many things that will attempt to, to pull us away from that thought, to knock us off that establishing, if I may. And here in Colossians chapter 2, we find our verses for this morning, and we'll go around the book of Colossians as we look at what another aspect of this means to be rooted in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Remember that we have received Jesus Christ, the Bible says, by faith. But as many as received him, that is trust in him by faith, to them gave he power to be called the sons of God. Someone, when they put their faith in Jesus Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's how someone receives Jesus Christ. The Bible calls it salvation, forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. My friends, salvation is a free gift from God that we receive when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Verse 7. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Verse 8, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Lord, as we come to your word this morning, I'd ask that you would stop any distractions that could distract your word from touching us. Lord, I pray that in the service this morning, <coughs> you would give us the clarity. Lord, give us the, the wisdom and give us the strength to follow you. Lord, help me as I speak to say those things that would, which would please you. And Lord, I pray that today, everything that you want to be accomplished would be accomplished now. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got just a touch of a cough. I'm sure it's COVID. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Such a terrible joke. Should not joke that way in church. We're not allowed to in church, are we? But Colossians chapter 2, in this particular passage, the whole book is pointing us to Jesus Christ. We find in Colossians chapter 1, I would say the key verse for this particular book, Colossians 1 verse 18, that in all things, he that is Jesus might have the preeminence. He might have the priority. That in everything that we do as a Christian, Jesus Christ would be at the center. Or today, I'm going to challenge us that Jesus Christ must be the source. I have some questions to ask you this morning to maybe begin and help us think about whether Jesus Christ is truly the source in our life. What puts a smile on your face? Well, when I open up my banking app and I see my Roth IRA is up, a smile goes on my face. When I see it's down, not so much. What brightens your day? No school. <coughs> we say things like, well, that guy settled down after marriage. Kids made him grow up. Ladies, if you're having a bad day, does chocolate change your day? Do you stress eat? You say, Pastor, don't talk about chocolate in church. Two problems. One, it's too personal, and two, now I'm hungry. Ever happened to you in church? Someone talk, start talking about food, and then you can't get your mind off food? I won't even go there and talk about ribeye steak or apple pie or anything like that. Now I'm hungry. What I've found, and maybe what you've found as well, is that many times in our life, we begin to allow other things to be our source rather than Jesus Christ. We begin to find that, that the outside circumstances and situations will have a bigger impact on our life than what should, and that is the source of Jesus Christ. 
We claim to be Christians, and rightfully so, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. But even though we're Christians, we're still susceptible to finding our enjoyment and satisfaction, having our day brightened by other things. Now understand that God has given all things for our benefit. He's a good and gracious God. But we cannot miss this point, that we are called as Christians to be rooted or to have the source of everything in our life come from and flow from Jesus Christ. This word rooted is, of course, an idea of a tree or a plant. Inside of that particular thought process, there is what a root that's called a tap root. Not every, uh, not every plant has a large tap root. Some have roots that go thin and, and close to the surface, but a tap root will go straight down. There are some plants that the tap root will be three to five times what you see on top, bigger under the surface. And even more than that. The taproot will go straight down and it'll gather its sustenance. It'll gather its life force from underneath so that what you see up here is merely and merely an external display of what is happening way down here. What I want to challenge us on the day is to make sure that you and I, if we're not a Christian, to be a Christian, trust in Jesus Christ. But if we're a Christian, to make sure that what people see up here is coming, down, coming from something that goes way down there, the source of Jesus Christ. I read about a study that they found that, that in Christians, unfortunately, in religious Christians or religious people, there was very little difference between churchgoers and non-churchgoers. They found that their levels of emotions and even lying and and cheating and stealing were similar in both groups. Because going to church is not a source. Now, you ought to go to church. I'm glad you're in church this morning. But just going to church does not mean that everything up here will be right. What does it look like to be rooted in Jesus Christ? There's a devious trap that entices us to find our pleasures, that answers and security in a life lived outside of Jesus Christ. A mom's having a bad day and a call from a college student changes the whole day, showing that the source is a college student, not Jesus Christ. A man is struggling, but when he figures out the solution to his little car problem, now his attitude is different, showing that his source is a solution to a car problem, not Jesus Christ. A good day or a bad day determined by circumstances. A good reaction or bad reaction determined by other interactions. And it starts when we're young. I spent 12 years as principal at Bridgeport Baptist Academy. I figured out a couple things very quickly. Number one, there are three sides to every story. Person A, person B, and the truth. Three sides to every story. I also found out that very often in life, whoever was at fault was not really at fault. The student's in trouble. Well, you see, Pastor J.D., the reason this happened is because so-and-so did this. Some parents would call me sometimes and say, boy, I'm worried about my child. All, them around, all of the students around them are really pulling them down. Maybe your kid's pulling them down. What we're saying is that everything around us is dictating inside of us. I want to give us quickly this morning three tests to kind of reveal if our source is not Jesus Christ and then three truths from Colossians chapter 2 and 3 to show us what it looks like when our source is Jesus Christ. Three tests to realize that Jesus isn't the source. The test number one, when we allow the outside to alter the inside. There's a story told some musicians in London noticed that these errand boys all whistled out of tune. And they couldn't figure out why all these errand boys were running around the city of London, all whistled out of tune, and all whistled the same tune out of tune. Until they realized that the one set of bells on the Westminster were slightly out of tune. And the boys had copied what they had heard over and over, and they had copied the out-of-tune bell sound, thinking 
that it was right. My friends, so it is with our lives. There are times that if we're not sourcing from Jesus Christ, that we will copy these out-of-tune emotions and out-of-tune reactions. Someone else will see a life and they hear that we claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And yet our lives are out of tune at our job and out of tune with our family and out of tune emotionally because we've allowed something externally to set the inward pitch, if I can, to use a music analogy. We've allowed these external situations and circumstances, the outside, to alter the inside. Well, that's just the way I was raised is not a good excuse. Well, that's just how I am is merely a self-fulfilling prophecy. You see, when we allow the outside to alter the inside, we've now made our source not Jesus, but everything around us. When things are up, we're happy. When things are down, boy, we are in the dumps. And I imagine that you've experienced some of this as you've grown as a Christian and you've probably met some people this way as well. They walk into work or walk into school or, or come home, perhaps they live with you, and, and you see the storm cloud. You're like, uh-oh, watch out. Watch out. Mark this, that someone's showing that their source is in circumstances, not in Jesus Christ. Number two test. Not only do we allow the outside to alter the inside, but we look for confirmation and acceptance from the outside. Boy, you find this all day, every day with social media. People put pictures up of themselves. Selfies, they call them. And most people are terrible at taking pictures of themselves, just in case you're wondering. But they practice, they put that picture online there, and you see the comments that follow. Beautiful, love it, amazing. You look at it and you're like, yikes. Someone should tell them that was terrible. You ever notice on social media, almost always it's just glamour and good? Like people are presenting a perfect life? You ever notice that? And what happens is if we're not careful, we look for our confirmation and acceptance from the outside. With the teenagers, we call it peer pressure. And it's a real thing. It's a real thing when the peer pressure comes. But it doesn't stop with teenagers, does it, adults? They've done studies on this. They've made observations when there's been problems in society and maybe someone uh, is attacked and no one else steps up. This peer pressure, it's a real thing. I read a story about a man. He was in a carnival, and in his younger days, he was blasted out of a cannon over 1,200 times. Now, I don't care who you are. If you're shot out of a cannon more than two times, something's wrong with you. <laughs> All right, one time, Mark, I can forgive. What's that like? The second time, no, 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 no. no. You got something wrong up here. But 12, over 1,200 times. And they asked him, why have you done this over 12? Like, like what? In the vernacular, have you lost your ever-loving mind? This was an answer. Have you ever heard the applause of 60,000 people? You know what he says? You know what he's saying? He said, I find my confirmation, my acceptance in the external. And I doubt many of you have been blasted out of a cannon. I sure hope not. But I find that we're guilty of the same thing. We're looking for the compliment. We're looking for someone else to support us and prop us up. We're having a bad day and we, and we reach out. Hey, and, and, and listen, I'm not against us encouraging each other. The Bible talks about that. That's a different sermon. What I'm saying is we can't find our support just from the outside. We can't be propped up from the outside. We must find our support, our source from Jesus Christ. We reach out, say, man, having a bad day, and people post down there, so sorry, so sorry, and now we're having a good day. Mark this, that's someone who's finding confirmation and acceptance from the outside. Someone said this, all of us like being affirmed, but just remember that getting a thousand likes doesn't make you a better person. You see, we have traded the source of Jesus Christ for 60,000 people and a thumbs up. And not only is it that we allow the outside to alter the, the inside or that we look for confirmation and acceptance from the outside, but we keep on looking for external solutions to internal problems. 
You know that people are looking for a few things. Love, joy, contentment, satisfaction. All things that God promises to give. Where do people look for love? Everywhere. Everywhere. They want to find someone who accept them for who they are. Studying for the sermon, I read some articles about, about the uber-rich. And the uber-rich, they said, you're in the top 1% in the world. And they had some telling statements about the uber-rich of their own, own words. Some statements that I read preparing for this sermon, they said, I sure wish I could find someone who would just like me for me. What they're saying is, listen, I have all these things and I'm trying to solve an external problem, an internal problem with an external solution. You can buy friends for a little while. The prodigal son found that out, but after a while you find out that they weren't truly your friends. We look for external solutions to internal problems. We want to find joy. And so we begin to just live life in a crazy way. And some people will be called adrenaline junkies, looking for the next rush of adrenaline, a faster motorcycle, a higher uh, roller coaster, a more daredevil stunt. Others turn to illicit substances. So listen, I can't handle the problems and the pressures, and so I turn and I, and I want to get rid of it. And so I, I want to solve this internal problem with an external solution. What they're saying is, listen, I'm not sourcing from Jesus Christ. I'm sourcing from the outside. Others will cover it with laughter. some point in church here, I'm going to preach on Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. Solomon literally had all the answers. All the answers from God. In Ecclesiastes, we find, I think it's chapter number two, where Solomon says, I tried everything. I tried building projects. He said, I built gardens and pools, and that didn't work. He said, I tried mirth. I tried laughter. In essence, he hired comedians to make him laugh and to, to drown away life's problems, and that didn't work. Solomon tried everything with riches and all these areas, and he said, listen, it's all vanity because life lived apart from God is empty. Let's look here, though. I won't want to leave us in a depressed state. The Bible tells us what life looks like lived with Jesus Christ. Why don't you look in chapter 3? We're going to see three keys from chapter 3 or three truths from chapter 3. Simple yet profound moving thoughts. Look in verse number one. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Truth number one. When life is sourced from Jesus Christ, we live not for the internal, not for the external, but for the eternal. When a life is lived for Jesus Christ, we don't live for the internal, just some more joy, just some more satisfaction. We don't live for the external, what I can get, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world yet lose his own soul. We don't live for the internal or for the external, but we live for the eternal. If a man be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Do you remember when subliminal, subliminal messages were a big deal? They were trying to put hidden messages inside of soft music. Back in the 90s, this was a really, really big operation. People would spend millions of dollars a year. In fact, in 1992, they spent 50 million a year on subliminal messages. And the thought was this. If you can play this good ideas that I can't hear, and I'll play it while I sleep, then when I wake up, I'll be a better person. Now, in concept, it'd be really cool. I mean, wouldn't it be great, students, if you could play all your math homework at night and wake up and know it? That'd be, that'd, be, that'd be great. I'd really like that. What if you could play the Bible and have it memorized the next day? Wouldn't that be really great? Except they found out that with all the money spent, it just simply doesn't work. Because something from the outside can't truly change the inside. We live not for the internal, not for the external, but for the eternal. That's why Hebrews says this way, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Someone said this, look around and be distressed. Look inside and be depressed. 
Look at Jesus and be at rest. What does it look like when someone lives for the eternal? What it means is that today I wake up and I think, God, how can I please you today? I may be happy. I may be sad. I may feel good. I may feel bad. It's like a Dr. Seuss poem. Oh, boy, I better stop right there. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> That's what it means when I, when I turn my attention to things above. When I'm at my job and I say, listen, God, what do you have for me here today? Sure, I got to put some bumpers on or I, I got to make this particular action or I got to clean this item or I got to be in this computer. But God, you have some things for me here today. Lord, what are you trying to teach me here today? Lord, what kind of opportunities do you have? What kind of people are you going to bring across my path that I can touch for eternity? That's someone who's sourcing from Jesus Christ, who looks not just for the internal or for the external, but looks for the internal. When was the last time you went to work and said, God, do something eternal through me today? Because when you're sourcing from Jesus Christ, you're going to pray that way. You're going to work that way. Then when the boss calls you in and says, listen, you're blowing it. It's terrible. You're okay. You know why? Because you're looking for the eternal, not just right here. You see, too often, it's just on the outside where we're touched that way and, and or the inside and, and you have a bad day. Why? I don't feel good. And listen, there are those days, right? We wake up, we just feel, ugh. Anybody else have those days? Mondays? What's wrong? Monday. Right, but for the eternal, we say, listen, no, it's not internal or external, it's for the eternal. Colossians 3, verse 1, number 2. Number 2, we're fulfilled, not by the visible, but by the invisible. Look at verse number 2. Set your affection. Set your affection on things of chocolate, of gold, of likes, of accomplishments, of success, of promotion. You look at it. What does it say? Does it say those things? Yet how often do we find ourselves fulfilled by those things? Man, I just got this promotion. Boy, now life is good. <laughs> Listen, I just had this meal. Set your affection on things above, the indivisible not on things on the earth. Henry Martin was his name. He was a Cambridge University student. He was a mathematics genius. At the age of 20, age of 20, he got every accomplishment and every recognition, the highest recognition possible in the mathematic fields. And yet he said that he felt strangely unfulfilled. Instead of finding fulfillment in his achievements, he said, I only grasped a shadow. Have you ever chased a shadow? If you've gone after money, you have. It's merely a shadow of fulfillment. If you've leaned on chocolate, you have. If you thought the promotion was it, you have. He said, I only grasped a shadow. And after evaluating his goals, he sailed to India as a missionary at the age of 24. And only, he only lived another seven years. 31, he died. Apparently contracted something there in India. By the human stretch, we would say he died too young. We would say his life was wasted because he was accomplished in his field and could have gone on for years and, and been successful. And he made this statement, Lord, let me burn out for you. And I would submit those seven years he spent burning out for Jesus Christ were far more profitable than the 24 previous years of his life. Oh, and by the way, he translated the New Testament into three difficult languages in those seven years, just in case you're wondering. You see, we're fulfilled not by the visible, but by the invisible. It's not going out to the garage and seeing the vehicles. It's not looking at the account and seeing the, the balance. 
It's not even hearing from a loved one. It's the fact that Jesus Christ has saved me and I am fulfilled not by the things on earth, but by the things above. Number three, we not only live for the internal, not the external, but the eternal and fulfilled by the invisible. Number three, we realize that we don't just exist with Christ. We exist for Christ. Look in verse number three. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life. Someone who is sourced and has a source of Jesus Christ realizes that the only reason we exist is because of and for Jesus Christ. The man who started the Salvation Army was the name of General William Booth. End of his life, over 80 years old, they asked, someone asked him, General Booth, would you give us the secret of success for the Salvation Army? The story goes that General William Booth hesitated for a second with tears flowing down his face. He said, it's because God was with me all the time. He said, there have been men greater, with greater brains than me and greater opportunities than me. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision for what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth there was and that I would have all of God. And kind of as a side, side note, he said, so if there's been any success, it's because it's the greatness of a measure of a man's surrender. Someone counted the Bible and they said there's over 256 names for Jesus Christ in the Bible or titles. Someone else did another study and came up with 952 different names and titles for God in the Bible and and for God and Jesus in the Bible. All I know is this He's so big, He's so infinite, He probably just can't be held up just in one title and name. There was a man who lost everything he had in business. Lost everything he had in business, a sizable fortune and a beautiful home. The story that I read along the way, his wife also passed. He was out one day. He noticed some men who were working on their large building carving some rock. He was depressed, he was down, and he saw these men chipping and carving. He saw this, this piece. He said it was a smaller piece like a triangle. And he asked the men, he goes, where, where does that particular piece go? The men said, oh, sir, not knowing his story or situation. He said, this little piece right here, we're forming down here because it'll fit in really well up there. He noticed near the top of the steeple there was a small space where that stone would fit perfectly. The man walked away with his heart encouraged and pricked. Because he said, you know what, Lord, you're doing something down here to make sure that I'm suitable for up there. Billy Wilcox was talking about trouble and disaster. Talked about this couple who had a six-month-old baby pass away. Can you imagine the heartache? Some of you can An old man came to them, to this couple, whose child had passed. He gave them some wisdom. He said, when trouble comes, some people are like an egg. When the water boils, they become hard. He said, some are like a potato, which becomes soft and pliable. He told them, be a potato. I'd go on in that story and I'd say this. When you have Jesus Christ as your source, you're a potato. When it's external, you're an egg. There's a restaurant in town. And they have this title on the restaurant, Food Locally Sourced. What they mean by that is everything that you eat in this restaurant, the meat that you eat, the eggs and the dairy, the milk and the cheese, is all Obtained from a local farmers and growers. 
It's a big deal for restaurants to be locally sourced. But I can't help but think about this, my friend. God wants you and me as Christians to be locally sourced. So that everything that someone sees, everything that someone tastes when they interact with us, everything that someone observes is sourced from Jesus Christ. Too often in life, we source our joy, contentment, satisfaction, and approval from outside situations. And we're challenged to be rooted in him, to be sourced in Jesus. Living for the eternal, not the external and internal. Being fulfilled with the invisible, not the visible. And realizing that we consist with Jesus Christ. 